Our Share of Night is a 700 plus page horror epic written by legendary Argentinian author Mariana Enriquez and translated from the Spanish by Megan McDowell. This is a colossal work of horror fiction. It is intensely political, brilliantly allegorical, it is smart, it is tender, it is frightening, it is a family drama about inherited trauma, it is a scathing attack on colonialism, empire, the bourgeoisie, class disparity, and more. And it's also a tremendously fantastic piece of horror fiction. I am amazed at the breadth and scope of this novel. What's interesting is that until I read Our Share of Night, I had only read Mariana Enriquez's short stories. I've read two short story collections, Things We Lost in the Fire and The Dangers of Smoking in Bed, both of which were also translated by Megan McDowell. And then I read this giant beast, so I've read nothing in between. In English translation, we have no ordinary length novels from Enriquez. We have short story collections and this enormous thing. There's nothing in the middle. So we've gone from short stories, which are all gothic and dark and bleak and politically allegorical, to this, which is also gothic and dark and bleak and politically allegorical. Primarily, Our Share of Night is about a cult. Our protagonist at the beginning is a man in his early 30s named Juan. Juan is a medium who has been wrangled in by this cult to bridge the gap between our world and the world of the gods that they worship. This cult has chapters all around the world and we're focusing on the Argentinian branch. All of the cult's primary members are rich, powerful, aristocratic, capitalistic, twisted monsters. And what they're after is to eliminate their enemies, to maintain their wealth and power and privilege, and ultimately to seek immortality, literally. And the thing that they worship, the darkness, is a real thing in this novel. They're not deluded. There really is a Lovecraftian demonic god that they worship. When the story begins, it's 1981 and Juan has a six-year-old son called Gaspar. Juan has noticed that Gaspar has the powers of a medium. And if he's not careful, this cult that he has been desperately trying to avoid and run away from for so long, will wrangle his son in as a replacement for him. Juan was married to a member of this cult called The Order, but she died. And now, when we begin, Juan and Gaspar are on the run. They're on the road trying to escape and figure out how to cloak Gaspar from The Order, who reach far across the entire world. The novel begins at a time of martial law and dictatorship in Argentina, and it moves forward through the 80s into the 90s, flashes back to the 70s, and then forward again to the 90s at the end. We're covering a lot of ground and a lot of time, from dictatorship to the shift into democracy. This is a political novel, but it's also political in its allegories. As I said, this is a book about colonialism, about wealth disparity, about power, about the elite versus the vulnerable. It's also a novel that wears its influences on its sleeve. When we begin in part one, following Juan's journey to try and keep Gaspar safe, and we're introduced to the order and the thing that they worship, it's very Lovecraftian, but it flips Lovecraft's script. Lovecraft was a racist. This book instead twists Lovecraftian themes and politics entirely on its head. This is a book where the cult are powerful. They are elite. They are rich and wealthy and influential people. They are deluded and frightening. But it's very Lovecraftian in its atmosphere, in what the cult does, in what the darkness is, in what lies beyond that veil. So we begin very Lovecraftian. But in part three, we move into something very Stephen King inspired. We're following Gaspar around the age of 12. He and his friends are all riding bikes, sneaking into abandoned haunted houses in their neighborhood. Democracy has been restored in Argentina. And this section of the book feels like Stephen King's It. Then in part five, when we flash back to the 70s and the 80s, this book becomes a piece of dark academia. We look at the cult from the inside. 
and it reminds us of Donatart's The Secret History. It's a book about the privileged elite having no boundaries, having nobody to stop them, being able to do terrible, awful things, commit taboos, commit murders, be entirely unshackled and unrestrained by society, being able to run amok and flaunt their wealth, power, and privilege however they feel like. It's Dark Academia. And in terms of what the cult does and what they're after, it also reminded me of Jordan Peele's movie Get Out, a film about the privileged and powerful elite using the bodies and the minds and the skills of vulnerable and marginalized people in order to maintain their privilege and gain immortality. All of that is in this. So there are a lot of clear influences, or at least things that the book reminded me of, but this is also greater than the sum of its parts. This is a novel about Argentina specifically, about a very specific place and time. And I confess, I don't know a lot about the history and politics of 1980s and 90s Argentina, but the connections in the novel between Argentina and the UK, the ways in which it examines patriarchy, colonialism and empire, the privileged rich versus the marginalized and vulnerable poor, it's powerful, it's scathing, it has claws. And it's also a very effective and long and slow and intense and atmospheric horror novel. Again, in that way, it feels very Stephen King. His books are long, they're frightening, but the fear is drawn out and that's all in here. It does sometimes feel like it, especially when you're following a young boy and all of his friends riding their bikes and visiting haunted houses, as I said. Horror fans are going to find a lot to love here because it's about a cult, because it's Lovecraftian, because you see what this god is capable of. You see what the cult does. You see beyond that veil at certain moments. There is blood, there is gore, there are disappearances, people are lost, people are destroyed, people's lives are changed. The stakes are high, the horror is real. But it's also a family drama. In trying to keep Gaspar safe, Juan is abusive. He's frightened and panicked, he's not a very good dad, he's lost his wife, he's traumatized by the fact that he's been wrangled into this cult since he was a boy, all because he has these powers, and he didn't ask for any of this. But the cult is also a family. Juan's late wife was a member of this cult, and this cult is her entire family. Her parents are at the head of the Argentinian sect of this cult. It's about generational trauma, what families do to us. When you join a family, the effect that that family can have on you, your mental health, your physical well-being, your station in life. And then Juan is worried that Gaspar is going to inherit all of this pain, suffering, trauma. He will not be his own person. He will not be free because that's what family can do to us. The effect that parents can have on their kids is monstrous and traumatizing at times. It's incredible just how much is covered here, politically, economically, socially, familially. <laughs> and remember, this book is 700 pages. There's so much in here. The political and social metaphors are tightly crafted, they're very specific, but they also leave a lot to be interpreted. Primarily, I saw this as a book about privileged people doing whatever is necessary to hold on to their privilege, their wealth, their power and their influence, and the ordinary people who are sacrificed and used as tools in order for those privileged people to maintain their status and their power. It's an anti-capitalist novel. In capitalism, our bodies, our minds, our time, our health, our resources, our intelligence, our skills, everything is a commodity. Everything is a weapon. Everything is a tool, and we are drained dry by it. We are commodified. We are used as things, and this book explores all of that. The villains in this are an oligarchy, but the victims that we are following are also creating trauma for one another and for themselves. Familial trauma, generational trauma, again, is all explored here. If you've watched a lot of my reviews, a lot of my videos, you know that I gravitate towards books that explore capitalism, class disparity, family drama, inherited trauma, all of these things, and it's all in here. This is, in some ways, my perfect book when it comes to its themes and its allegories. 
These are the things that I like to think about, I like to explore, the things that hit me hardest, and it's all in here. And it's a horror novel, my favourite genre. So this is a pretty perfect book for me. And Mariana Enriquez is one of my favourite authors. Argentinian literature is some of my favourite literature. I couldn't really ask for more. My only gripe is the fact that it's long, and I struggle with long books, but I finished it. I read it in about four or five days. I tore through this book as quickly as I possibly could, because I love her, I love the genre, I love what it was exploring, I just struggle with long books. But I didn't really struggle with this one. I felt tired towards the end, honestly. But that's just me. That's just what long books do to my brain. Otherwise, this is perfect. Perfect horror novel. It's Lovecraftian. It's Stephen King-esque. It's Dark Academia. It has powerful economic and political and social allegories being explored. I loved everything about it. Please check out Our Share of Night. It's incredible. And subscribe for books.